Who is the greatest threat to the people now? The finale of Game of Thrones is called the Iron Throne, and it hinges on the event the whole series has been building to, the destruction of that bewitching, corrupting symbol of ultimate power. In a roundabout way, Daenerys Targaryen does make good on her promise to break the wheel. It's a beautiful dream, stopping the wheel. You're not the first person who's ever dreamt it. I'm not going to stop the wheel. I'm going to break the wheel. Instead of being the savior she believed herself to be, it turns out she's the danger the world needs saving from. But her invasion and death result in the old back and forth between warring rulers getting replaced with a new, more enlightened form of government. Sons of kings can be cruel and stupid, as you well know. His will never torment us. That is the wheel our queen wanted to break. Since there's so much to talk about when it comes to the Game of Thrones finale, we're going to do a second video unpacking the rest of it. But in this video, we're just going to focus on Danny's ending. While her transformation in the final season feels rushed, the groundwork for her eventual descent into tyranny can be traced back to the beginning of the series. And I will take what is mine! With fire and blood, I will take it." The early sparks of her determination to disrupt the existing order finally flame up into an all-consuming obsession with wielding total, unchallenged power over a new world that bows to her. And as she ends up Queen of the Ashes, becoming the very thing she set out to destroy. You're not here to be Queen of the Ashes. No. The tragic fate of this great character contains the true heart and soul of this story. So here's our take on the deeper moral in the elimination of the Iron Throne, the downfall of the Dragon Queen, and the death of her dream. Before we go on, we want to tell you a little bit about this video's sponsor. Mubi is a curated film streaming service with a twist. You get 30 films per month, a new film every day. It's a hand-picked selection of movie gems from around the world. So click the link in our description below to get a full month of Mubi for free. We open with Tyrion walking through the burning remains of his home city, forcing himself to stare the consequences of his mistakes in the face. Acknowledging that his idealistic dream to bring about a better world through the Dragon Queen is dead. He weeps for all that he destroyed in the service of a lie, as his family's melody The Reigns of Castamere plays one last time. <laughs> In our first glimpse of Daenerys after her mass killing, the cinematography reinforces that she has become the dragon, just as the visuals announced in the bells just before she killed Varys. Now that her raging Targaryen dragon has been woken, You don't want to wake the dragon, do you? The world is feeling the pain. Daenerys the Tyrant is a dark inversion of the liberator she once was. The emancipation she now promises to bring to the rest of the world is in fact death. This sequence echoes Lainey Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will, and it might make us look back at past Daenerys scenes to find parallels to Nazi or fascist imagery foreshadowing the totalitarian she would become. Daenerys' turn actually is a logical and poetic end to her character arc. You can watch our video comparing Daenerys to Cersei for a closer look at how the show hinted all along that Danny had this potential. However, the missed opportunity is that the final steps of Danny's journey happened so quickly. Her decision to burn King's Landing is explained mainly through this look on her face. <laughs> It's only in the Inside the Episode commentary that we get a deeper insight into what glimpsing the Red Keep here triggers in her. I don't think she decided ahead of time that she was going to do what she did. And then she sees the Red Keep, which is to her the home that her family built when they first came over to this country 300 years ago. <laughs> it's in that moment on, on the walls of King's Landing when she's looking at that symbol of everything that was taken from her when she makes the decision to 
to make this personal. This is an incredibly interesting point that unfortunately didn't quite make it into the script itself. If it had, it may have illuminated for viewers the true subconscious reason Danny makes the choice she does. Along her way, Daenerys has convinced herself that she wants to rule for the people and created a utopian ideology around herself as a benevolent freedom fighter. Together we will leave the world a better place than we found it." While on a repressed, involuntary, emotional level, the Iron Throne is actually a symbol to her of pain and trauma. So even though she doesn't understand this herself, all this time her inner dragon wasn't really driven by hope or the promise of change, but by rage and the will to avenge the abuse she endured at the hands of her enemies. "'When my dragons are grown, we will take back what was stolen from me and destroy those who have wronged me. We will lay waste to armies and burn cities to the ground." And this duality of the beautiful-sounding rhetoric and the hate-fueled emotional truth coalesces into a dictator who is all the more terrifying, because her dreamy story allows her to keep believing her actions are righteous, no matter the body count. "'I'm here to free the world from tyrants. That is my destiny and I will serve it no matter the cost." Tyrion resigns as Daenerys' hand, which is what you might call the definition of too little too late. Not to mention that he was about to be tried for treason anyway. Despite how clear it seems to everyone else that Daenerys is now the villain, I'm gonna know a killer when I see one. Jon Snow drags his feet and pays unconvincing lip service to his queen. Must it matter what I do? It matters more than anything. So the imprisoned Tyrion persuades Jon that he has to kill Daenerys, through a brief analysis of what went wrong for the Breaker of Chains. She liberated the people of Slaver's Bay. She liberated the people of King's Landing. And she'll go on liberating until the people of the world are free. And she rules them all." As Daenerys freed slaves in her path to the Iron Throne, she faced win-wins that allowed her to avoid tough decisions. She picked up armies she didn't have to pay for, while she got to feel squarely in the moral right because all the men she killed were bad guys. "'When she murdered the slavers of Astapor, I'm sure no one but the slavers complained. After all, they were evil men. When she crucified hundreds of Myronese nobles, who could argue they were evil men? The more absolute power she consolidated, the more she was lauded as a selfless hero. Everywhere she goes, evil men die, and we cheer her for it. Even her closest friends and advisors were deferential servants, not equals. Do not walk away from your queen while I command you to find the cure. She bought me from my master and set me free. That was good of her. Of course, you're serving her now, aren't you? Being hailed as a savior for so long has made her fall for that narrative more than anyone. Do you know what kept me standing through all those years in exile? Faith. Not in any gods. Not in myths and legends. In myself. She's come to believe she's a goddess among men. So when she slides into doing the wrong thing... Children! Little children! Bird! I tried to make peace with Cersei. She used their innocence as a weapon against me. It becomes easy for her to justify why. If she did it, it must be right. How'd you know? How'd you know it'll be good? Because I know what is good. When she talks to John about deciding what's best on the people's behalf, What about everyone else? All the other people who think they know what's good, they don't get to choose. Out of context, her words sound entitled beyond belief. But if you are the person who has freed countless souls from chains, when all those people never imagined freedom was a possibility, you would feel you know better than everyone else what is best for them. It's not easy to see something that's never been before. It's almost impossible to imagine walking through fire and experiencing the intense worship she's known without coming to think you have superhuman rights to decide the future of the world. But when the fire burned out, I was unhurt. The mother of dragons. Do you understand? I'm no ordinary woman. Many monarchs throughout history declared their divine right to rule based on far less. I'm the last hope of a dynasty, Mormon. 
the greatest dynasty this world has ever seen on my shoulders since I was five years old. Daenerys once put forward a dazzling vision of breaking the wheel. Lannister, Targaryen, Baratheon, Stark, Tyrell. They're all just spokes on a wheel. This one's on top, then that one's on top, and on and on it spins, crushing those on the ground. But in the end, she couldn't resist the allure of becoming another spoke on it. Because feeling like a god on earth will destroy anyone. And she grows more powerful and more sure that she is good and right. She believes her destiny is to build a better world for everyone. If you believed that, if you truly believed it, wouldn't you kill whoever stood between you and paradise? In fact, Daenerys' tale is really the story of the most powerful ruler who ever was. And perhaps the best, too. That's why almost everyone she meets falls in love with her. I love her, too. Not as successfully as you. I love you. The mother of dragons! <laughs> it appears you're not the only Targaryen supporter. And we, the viewers, did too. The tragedy is that it's this very immensity of potential, Daenerys' exceptional, even supernatural power, that makes her even more dangerous than a Cersei, or indeed than any other ruler who ever tried to stop the wheel before. The greater the power, the greater the temptation to misuse it, to seize control over all people, and ultimately to destroy all life unless it perfectly obeys which is a vision of total global slavery, exactly the thing Daenerys sought to end. Do not become what you have always struggled to defeat. Despite the number of hints were given that Daenerys would evolve into a tyrant, Where are my dragons? Tyrion gets it wrong when he says, Our queen's nature is fire and blood. The point the story is making isn't that Daenerys was evil all along, or that her Targaryen coin fell on the wrong side. You think our house words are stamped on our bodies when we're born, and that's who we are? Ah, then I'd be fire and blood too. It's that ultimately this strongest and best of people still couldn't withstand the temptations of ultimate power. So it's because of all this logic that Daenerys' tragedy is a cautionary tale illustrating that no person can ever rule justly if their control is unchecked by important restraints. This commentary on what absolute power is and what it does to the soul is really the whole point of Game of Thrones. She is no longer yours to torment. Everyone is mine to torment. Daenerys' story has to end with the throne being destroyed. The best way to understand the significance and inevitability of this ending is to look at one of Martin's biggest influences, the Lord of the Rings. The allure of the magical ring is supernatural, more or less impossible to overcome. And the throne is this story's version of the ring. When Daenerys finally lays eyes on the throne, she looks almost like Gollum, spying his precious. And on a deeper level, she might remind us of the beautiful elf Galadriel. Frodo offers her the ring because if anyone were capable of wielding it justly, it would be her. I do not deny that my heart has greatly desired this. But while Galadriel is tempted by the vision of herself as the all-powerful queen, She refuses, understanding that she would be lost to the ring if she accepted. I will diminish and go into the west and remain Galadriel. And as John kills Danny, his last words to her, You are my queen. Now and always. Are a tribute to the underlying beautiful and good person that she really is beneath the monster the throne has made. His words frame the murder as an act of freeing her true self from the throne's corrupting influence. And the crucial symbolic moment comes when Drogon appears, giving every indication that he's about to breathe fire on the man who just killed his mother, but instead, he destroys the Iron Throne, underlining that it was indeed the throne that killed the real Daenerys. Just as the ring is destroyed by falling into Mount Doom where it was forged, the Iron Throne is destroyed by dragon fire, which is what Aegon used to forge it. Forged in the fiery breath of Beleriand the Dread. So the finale reveals that despite how it looked for a while, Jon is not the Aragorn or final king of this story. You're the true king. He's Frodo. You are the shield that guards the realms of men. The suffering ring bearer. He's the only one who can bear the heaviest burden of being the closest to the throne, as symbolized by the fact that he's the rightful heir. You are Aegon Targaryen, true heir to the Iron Throne. While not falling into its temptation. 
You are a ring bearer, Frodo. To bear a ring of power is to be alone. As many predicted, John is the prince who was promised. It's just that the Night King was not the looming darkness he was destined to save the world from. Daenerys was that darkness. It's a terrible thing I'm asking. It's also the right thing. Martin has said this is Daenerys and Jon's story. These two people represent fast-spreading, powerful, chaotic fire versus slow-moving, steady, rigid ice. We've seen countless parallels foreshadowing how deeply their journeys are intertwined. In season 7, Fire and Ice are irresistibly drawn to each other and fall in love. But in the end, it turns out the reason they are so interlinked is because one's fate is to destroy the other. This is our reason. It has been from the beginning since you were a little boy with a bastard's name. And I was a little girl who couldn't count to 20. This story of an overpowerful fire meeting its end through an equal and opposite ice is one of balance being restored. Love is the death of duty. Sometimes duty is the death of love. And Game of Thrones has always hinted at balance as the moral underlining the back and forths of this story of dualities and extremes. Danny's prophecy in the House of the Undying is very directly realized. What appeared to be snow in the vision was actually the falling debris of the city she would destroy. And this Queen of the Ashes is close enough to touch her greatest ambition, but she never gets to sit on it. In the vision, she walks out north of the wall and meets her deceased husband and lost baby. Just as in this future, Jon Snow, who is so linked to the North and its snow, sends her to join her dead. We might also note that Robert Baratheon foresaw this ending from the start. The Targaryen girl convinces her horse lord husband to invade. And the Dothraki horde crosses the narrow sea. We won't be able to stop them even though Ned Stark acted like he was crazy. And even Sam's dad, Randall Tarly, had a point when he refused to bend the knee. You, on the other hand, murdered your own father and chose to support a foreign invader, one with no ties to this land. Drogon takes his mother's body, and we later hear that he's gone east, which implies he's probably returning her remains to the Targaryen ancestral home of Valeria. For thousands of years, the Valerians were the best in the world at Almost everything. Or possibly bringing her to the Shadowlands beyond a shy, where the dragon eggs are said to come from. Dragon's eggs, Daenerys. And the Shadowlands beyond a shy. Drogon's behavior in this scene, especially his understanding that it was the throne and not Jon who killed Danny, reminds us that dragons are not just the scary, killing machines they seem to be in most of the show. They are actually very wise, ancient beings, as Tyrion once told us. Dragons are intelligent more intelligent than men, according to some maesters. Bran's later comment that he's going to search for Drogon, perhaps I can find him, suggests that the raven and the dragon share a deeper understanding of life's mysteries. While it's tempting to paint Daenerys' ultimate nature as the mad queen who was destined by her bloodline to burn cities to the ground, as she passes out of this world, she reminds us of the person she was in the very first episode, an abused, alone girl, the victim of a cruel world. I would let his whole tribe you. All 40,000 men and their horses too, if that's what it took. Actress Amelia Clark has talked about how, for her performance in her final scene, she tried to draw out the little girl inside this woman, who began as innocent and naive, full of hope and love. I imagined a mountain of swords too high to climb. So many fallen enemies, you could only see the soles of Aegon's feet. Daenerys' endpoint sadly takes away from our world the unequivocally empowering symbol of the strong woman who emerged from victimhood to become a beacon of hope for the oppressed. You're a dragon. Be a dragon. It raises the question of why female characters in positions of power so often tend to go crazy or get torn down. And out of context, the image of a man killing a woman while they're locked in a loving embrace, framed as a noble deed, is not a good thing to be sending out into our culture. But beyond the disappointment many feel to mourn their Khaleesi, Shameful. And the disjointedness of the last few steps in this journey, Danny's ending is the destination this meditation on power was always heading toward. Her inability to escape the cycle of hate and lust for absolute rule that has consumed her people for generations makes her the last casualty of an old world that her death will finally end. So Daenerys Stornborn of House Targaryen, first of her name, the Unburnt, Queen of the Andals and the First Men, Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, 
breaker of chains and mother of dragons can finally add the most coveted title to her list, breaker of the wheel. In our next video, we'll be talking about the choice to make Bran the Broken the new king and what the progress that Danny incites in Westeros actually looks like, and the significance of where the Starks end up. So look out for part two. We break the wheel together. Hey guys, this is Grace, and today I want to talk to you about one of our favorite places to watch movies, Mubi. Mubi is a treasure trove of films from around the globe. Every day a new film is added and the oldest is taken away. So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch, Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies, making it so much easier for you. They feature hard to come by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser known films by your favorite famous directors, and more. Plus, you can even download the films to watch offline. And there are no ads ever. To celebrate the Cannes Film Festival, which kicked off last week in France, right now on Mubi, you can check out their Cannes Takeover series, featuring an amazing selection of some of the best films from the festival's past. The lineup includes Alejandro González in Yaritu's Amores Peros, Nadine Labaki's Caramel, Palm Door winner Four Months, Three Weeks, and Two Days, and many more. We can't recommend Mubi highly enough. You can try it out now for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.